It's a Saturday night special. Time to put on your top hat, your dancing shoes, and join Mel, oops, sorry, and join Mel Brooks Saturday at 10.30 on NBC. Thanks for staying up later. That scene you just saw was from Mel Brooks' new movie, Life Stinks. Rudy DeLuca, the uh, fellow you're exchanging slaps with, is a Brooklyn boy. That's where you grew up, and we're going to start from that point, growing up in Brooklyn, because we got the whole week with Mel Brooks. It's a later first. It's Mel Brooks week. You own Monday through Thursday. Do not waste this golden opportunity. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you were, you were... That was sort of the preamble. Oh, you were talking. Okay. Yeah. Every time you talk, I'm hit with a sudden narcolepsy. <laughs> when I talk, it's, it's, there's a lot of joie de vivre. I'm very happy. Yeah, I, I can yeah. feel that bounce a, in your I'm presence. A, but when, for, I don't know what's, why is it, is it a certain somnambulistic timbre that you have in your voice that uh, just more, talk. more or less anesthetizes the audience? Is that what you're trying to say in your very diplomatic and caring way? Mm -hmm. Did it happen again? Yeah. Did I go, what? You know, there's a few people in the world that, that really put me out, put me to sleep. And it's not, it's not because they're not charming and, and they don't have elan and a certain, you know, bounce, but they have a certain thing in their voice that's like a <laughs> And you're one of the, you're blessed with that. So I've had to do... I better do most of the talking. So why, why, <laughs> because why don't you just I mean, pose? I'm going to be asleep for most of it. Why don't you just pose your own questions, and okay. I'll nod or nod off as the case may be. Okay. Uh, to begin with, all right. Rudy DeLuca may have been born in Brooklyn. I lied so I could get the Brooklyn connection, but I know that he went to school in the Bronx. But since the Bronx is a small province in the state of Brooklyn. It doesn't make any difference. Do people in New York watch the show, too? I certainly hope so. As long oh. as I don't put them to sleep with my first question. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm being terribly sorry. I'm, I'm going to have to hold these <laughs> yeah. reveries of yeah, mine in yeah, check. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll just go with short sort of headlines. That way you'll have no chance to kind of slip off into this netherworld of yours. <laughs> 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 My God, it's the ghost of Danny yeah. Thomas tonight yeah. on Later. Yeah, right. That, I'm sorry. No, I didn't mean to do that. That got, that, that got stuck, and I didn't want to swallow it because I was afraid I'd choke, so I spit it up. But I'm, I'm all right now. You sure? I'm fine. Uh, Rudy Luca was in, actually in uh, the next movie. He played the villain, High Anxiety. Remember me? Yep. Doing Sinatra? Huh? Anxiety ever, you're near. Society, <laughs> you, that I fear. Time has gone by. Time has gone by. And w we, we segued from I Anxiety, and I went on to do other movies. I did History of the World, Part One. I did To Be or Not to Be. I did Spaceballs. And lo and behold, one day the door opens, and I, you know, I pull up my pants, and... Uh, what were you doing? Going? No, there was, uh, I, was, I was in an interview. I don't know what the hell it was. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and, and Rudy comes in. He says, I got an idea. He's there, there with Ron Clark, and Barry Levinson is not with us anymore because he's one of the Academy Award. He doesn't talk to us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he, they come in with this college kid, Steve Haberman, who I thought was Jewish, turned out to be German. I still like him. He's a cute kid. Anyway, <laughs> they come up with this idea, something about the homeless. Let's do a movie about the homeless. So in 10 minutes, we had three jokes. We got excited. We thought, hey, this is a good idea. And th I'm, that's about three years ago. I'm giving you the, kind of the genesis of Life Stinks. Uh, early in the writing, uh, I, I don't know. Somebody turned to me and said, what do we call it? I said, I don't know. What, a, what do you think about Life Stinks? They said, that's good. That's good. Let's go with that. So. We always called it Life Stinks, a tentative title. And now it's, you know, we can't get rid of it because uh, the studio liked it, Alan Land Jr. liked it, people like it, so uh, we're going we're gonna to stick with it. It's not, a, you know, we, we're going to call it The Billionaire and the Bag Lady or some kind of 30s stupid title, but Life Stinks is, tells the story of, of, the, uh, of the movie, really, better than anything. What was your life like as a kid in Brooklyn? Were you funny right off the bat? Or was I... Right off the bat. From the womb? Yes. In the womb. What right from the womb? <laughs> Funny in the womb. 
Oh, I can't hear so good in here. What's going on here? <laughs> I was cute right away in the moon. So, hey, I think I'll swim over here. Oh, the kidneys are very funny looking. <laughs> look, they look like swimming pools in California. <laughs> I was pretty funny. I was always funny. I was always funny looking. I was not always amusing. But always, always, I could always do this. <laughs> I'm just laughing to try and keep Mel Brooks from nodding off here at about a, a quarter to two in the morning. In Brooklyn, somebody told me a story about y you shoplifted a cap gun or something at Woolworths. We had interesting adventures. One of my friends was Benji, and we had a... Um, Benji found a BB gun. I think he stole it, but I, I, look, it's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> and we were about seven or eight, and he was, he was you know, and he, he would... He would shoot a guy in a hat in the back, you know, with the thing from the roof. We were on the roof, and they were <laughs> shooting and laughing and laughing and shooting, and then suddenly he shoots and he looks at me and he says, oh my God, oh my God. He drops the gun, he holds it. I said, what's the matter? He says, I think I shot my mother in the ass. <laughs> There's a lady with a shopping bag. I didn't know till she turned. I didn't know it was my mother. Oh God, I shot my mother. You know. So he put a BB in her. I mean, it wasn't so bad. You know. That was one adventure. Another one was Benji and I went shop lifting instead of shopping. And we went to the Woolworths and we used to basically we'd steal yo-yos. Yeah. Because the guy at the yo-yo counter would walk the yo-yos and he would do tricks with the yo-yos and everybody would be watching this little Filipino guy walking the yo-yo, you know? He'd walk, we'd steal, you know? We had plenty of yo-yos. <laughs> we'd sell them for a penny apiece, we didn't know what to do with them. Anyway, uh, this day I was very uh, ambitious. There went some new cap pistols and pearl handle and, and uh, chromium and they, they looked wonderful. They, I think they sold for 75 cents. They were beautiful. And I took one, I examined it, I looked at it, turned it all over, looked around, shoved it in my jacket, and started for the door. Boom, my hand is on my shoulder. All right, son, you're under arrest. We saw you take that gun. You took that from the, from the counter, and you're coming to the manager's office with me. I pulled up, and I said, get away from me. I'll blow your head off. <laughs> He jumped back. I said, every, another guy said, I said, I'll kill you too. He jumped back. Now they saw me steal a cat pistol. I mean, I mean, why would they be afraid? But they jumped, they jumped, and I, I ran out. To this day, I have that cat. I was in Germany with the 78th Division. I, I used it. The Germans were afraid of it too. Everybody's afraid of a cat pistol. What kind of a soldier were you? Terrible. I was a terrible soldier. You were in the Battle of the Bulge, though, right? Well, it was really after that. It was you came after, to clean up, or I, what? Yeah, we came. It was it was very noisy. I don't know. I, <laughs> <laughs> believe it, the German Tiger tanks. That sirens on them. You know, it's not enough. That's a tank. <laughs> now you have to be afraid of a fire engine and an ambulance or something too, and it shoots. And every time it shoots, boom. I mean, I had these brown yellow stained ears you know i would take these cigarettes you know lucky's a camels you know we didn't have filters then and i would roll them up and i'd stick them in my ears because the war is so noisy i mean you can hardly stand it you know you can't read a paper you can't do anything <laughs> what do you do is this oy, oy, what the hell is going on here? and so i used to stay and my ears would get full of tobacco you know and they'd be all you know they, when they, every time I got an examination for 20 years later, they look and they go, what the hell is that? <laughs> Your ears are all nicotine stained and they smell from camels, you know? <laughs> and I would explain the war, the war. Anyway, we ran around in the war. <laughs> I became a corporal. A corporal, a line corporal, no, no little T, a line, two stripes. And I had a platoon and I would, one day, I'm sitting with my platoon, it's a true story and was sitting, trying to avoid the war somehow. And uh, we s we're, we're at a railroad unloading uh, area, and we see a case, and we kick the case, and there are rifles, German sniper rifles. They're these beautiful rifles. So we clean them up, and there's ammunition in another case, and we put the ammunition, and there are these white things. 
a lot of white things on Telegraph Pole. They're called insulators. And they're white and they're ceramic. And there's a lot of them. So for a buck a piece, we say whoever gets, you know, we open a buck into the pot. And bang, bang, bang. I think there was a guy, Libertini, from New Jersey. He, he was wonderful. He, he, he got nearly all of them, right? Right. We get back in our command car. We drive back. And we, we're singing dirty songs, whatever, you know. And, oh, uh, Gerda, Gerda, from Berserti, Gertie, I don't know. So we get back to the thing. They're running around like chickens went out their heads. What? What's, what's going on? Communications have been cut off between the 78th Division and the, <laughs> and the 7th Army. Why? I, there's a telephone. There was a, I said, oh, my God. <laughs> they said, well, uh, and we think there's a German patrol in the neighborhood, uh, you know, that's uh, that cutting the wires. And I said, let me volunteer. Come on, boys. We're going to go out and find <laughs> We're going to find those you know, because I knew, I knew, you know, I was like a hero. Uh, anyway, we went out, and I said we couldn't find them, you know. The, the Germans were, were sending some sort of, after the battle, they were sending some sort of propaganda out over the airwaves or through megaphones or something, and you had some idea about how to counter it? We, we had a loudspeaker, too. So we would set up some loudspeakers, and I would do double talk German. They wouldn't know what was going on. Are we doing it? Are they saying to us? Are they crazy? Are we crazy? We better surrender. You know what I mean? I would, I would yell back at them. You know what I mean? Did you sing to them? Yeah, I used to sing. I used to sing like uh, Bing Crosby. Here's what I sang to the, to the German infantry uh, during World War II. Oh, Brown. They didn't understand. <laughs> then Sweet Georgia Brown, which I later did with my wife in Polish, in To Be or Not To Be. Yeah. See, all these things come back. Use you and Ann right. Bancroft uh, singing Sweet Georgia Brown. You it sing like back. Boris Karloff. Years later, you put the words and the actions into Peter Boyle's mouth and, uh, and on the stage. Yeah, yes. It was, it was... I'm putting on my top hat, putting on my face, I'm topping up my face. <laughs> I'm stepping out in a... That's right, I used to do both of singing that. Something like putting on the Ritz, I forget, something. It was very sophisticated. I always like juxtapositions, juxtapositions, juxtapositions. I like a juxtaposition of texture. Something smooth, hard, metallic, and gleaming. Juxtaposed to something soft, dirty, cottony, woolly, and uh, with garnish in it, but hard, soft. So here we have putting on the red, serving Berlin. I'm putting on the top, right? Right. And then you have the soft, insane, uh, uh, lateral emission, and then see juxtapositions always work. It's it's grist for the mill. What is life? What is life anyway? Life is a, it, it's a walk through a meadow. It's picking up a daisy. It's smelling it, right? And it's meeting someone and maybe getting gonorrhea. What is life? <laughs> we don't know what it is. Because see, there's always something that spoils it, right? So we have to be careful. We should stick with the daisies in the meadow. And we should avoid intimate personal contact with people not in our own family. <laughs> <laughs> that being the case, I'll keep my distance from Mel Brooks right. during this commercial break. I loved horror movies when you were a kid, right? Yeah, but I did. I used to, uh, I hated them. I loved them because I hated them, you know. I hated them. They really scared you? Scared me. I used to be on, my, a, a constant dream was I was on a fire escape, and Frankenstein was always, for some reason, he chose to be in Brooklyn. He chose to be in Williamsburg. He chose to climb up our fire escape and go for me. I mean, if I'd figured it out, if I had some overview, some kind of objectivity, I would have said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Frankenstein is played by Boris Karloff. He lives in Santa Monica, California. There's no way he's going to go to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and climb up a fire escape and eat me up, you know? But I didn't know. I was 9 or 10. So I knew I had this recurring dream that he would climb the fire escape and I would wake up just as his knobs approached me, you know, those, those two knobs. I go, ah! <laughs> and then... See, when I was a kid, I always thought Frankenstein would be a good monster to be chased by because he moves so slowly. 
You know, you'd be scared to see him, but you could almost always get away because he just kind of like, uh, uh, from side to side. Yeah, but in a dream, I don't know why you do it to yourself, but you can't run fast. You'll yeah, you make, get that quicksand you thing. You make yourself run slower <laughs> or, or not be, you can't move. I don't know why we do that. It's the same thing with why we, why we, why we uh, uh, go out with short Jewish girls. I mean, there's no need. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but we go out with them. We just have to do that. Is it sort of in the charter? Yeah. It's like you, if you're born in Brooklyn, you've got to go out with a short Jewish girl. My mother was very short. My mother was only 4'10", 4'11", very short. Now, think of this. I have memories of my mother crossing the street with me, right? And I'm reaching up as high, as hard and as high as I can to hold her hand. She's 4'10". What am I, eight inches? <laughs> what am I, a foot? I mean, I must have been a person. I'm reaching up, right? So I remember reaching up the whole, I didn't want to lose her hand. And she's only four feet. I mean, that's amazing. Tomorrow night is, first of all, Tuesday. Part two of four parts, the entire week, belongs to Mel Brooks. Tomorrow, your show of shows. Until then, do you have any closing comments? Fadurned. Fadurned and Kell. Those, those meanings? Yes. In, you know what that means in Martian? What? If there is a supreme being, may he have the, take the time out of a busy day to bless you. See you later. For Derm. For Derm. <laughs>